So if you all start falling asleep, I'll take that as a sign that we need to be finished. <laughs> um, but I'm going to share with you a little bit about me and my testimony, and we're going to watch a video that explains my ministry, and then I'll tell you more about the two aspects of that that I'll be involved in in France, and then we'll close with um, a time of music. So I was born in Germany. My dad was in the Air Force, and uh, so we lived there until I was about four years old. And we moved to Missouri. Um, and then when I was in Missouri, you can't hear me. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't turn it on. Well, that's a tough one. Can you hear me now? Yeah. The same. Hello? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. There's no light on. Testing one. Oh, I hear it now. <laughs> okay, should I start over? <laughs> we'll just go back to Germany. Um, I was born in Germany. My dad is in the Air Force there. And then uh, when I was four, we moved to Missouri. And I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. So from a very young age, my parents uh, invested in teaching me God's word. And so I uh, knew who Jesus was. I knew that he came to die for us. I knew that I was a sinner. I mean, I knew that every day anyway, but I knew from the Bible also that I was a sinner. Uh, but I viewed salvation as someone else coming in my life telling me what to do, and I didn't like people telling me what to do, so I kept pushing that off and saying, no, no, I'm, I'm young, I don't want that. And then one Sunday, uh, our pastor preached a message, and at the end he said, if you were to die tonight, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? And I knew I wasn't, but again, I still thought, you know, I'm young, I can do this later, I don't want someone else telling me what to do. But thankfully, the Holy Spirit would not leave me alone that night. Um, after my parents put my brother and I to bed, I couldn't sleep. So I went and woke my parents up and said, I need to get saved tonight. And so I'm very thankful that that night God saved me. And I'd love to say it was an overnight thing that I changed and was a wonderful little girl. But it was a process. <laughs> just ask my parents. Um, but I am thankful to say that, that I know God is not just someone in my life telling me what to do. But I want to please him with my life. And I know I can do that by doing the things that please him, which we find in, in his scriptures. Um, and then a couple years later, my family moved to Belgium. There was a church in France, and the French government wouldn't renew the missionaries' visas, so they were moving it across the border into Belgium, and my parents were there and helped with that transition. So I was 13 and 14 at this time, and I learned French then. Um, I fell in love with Europe, and I wanted to go back. That was uh, my plans. I am a planner. I like to know what's going to happen in life, and um, I like it to go my way. And so God had a lot to teach me because I had all my ducks in a row and he was about to rearrange them. Uh, we moved back to the States a couple years later and that was not part of my plan. I said, God, I was going to serve you with my life, but you messed it up. Um, yes, that was very foolish. <laughs> but I'm thankful for the preparation that God gave me during those times as a young person. Those were formative years of my life and I got to learn how to live in European culture. I got to learn French. I mean, it's been 20 years, so I'm I'm working on it again. It's not fresh like it was then. Uh, but looking back, I can see each step of the way God preparing me for what he wanted me to do with my life, even though I had my own plans. Um, so then when I was in going into college, I went to study piano pedagogy to teach piano. My, my idea then was to have a piano studio here in the States to use music in the church that I was at. And um, the summer before my senior year of college, I was counselor at a camp down in Louisiana. And um, the first, first week there, the Lord started working in my heart to surrender to do whatever God wanted me to do with my life, not what I wanted to do with my life. And I said, Lord, I'm a counselor. My campers are supposed to be making decisions. I have to focus on them. So I pushed him off. And a few weeks later, um, thankfully, a pastor came and he preached a message from Exodus 3 and 4, and that's the burning bush. And Moses makes four different excuses over those two chapters, I think, of why he can't do what God asked him to do. And the pastor said, I wonder how God might have shown himself more powerful in Moses' life if he had said yes the first time. And obviously we don't know, but why are you making excuses to God? He said, I think there's people here who need 
to stop making excuses, say yes to God, whatever he wants with their life. And he said, I think there's even a counselor who needs to do that. I said, well, that must be me. How did he know? Um, and so that, that afternoon, I surrendered and I told the Lord, I'm done making my own plans and not consulting you, not being open to saying your will be done. And so here I am. And I had no idea what that would look like. Um, so I knew that I needed to do some sort of study in the Bible and working with people because ministry is people, right? Um, so I went and got a master's in biblical counseling from Northland Baptist Bible College up in Wisconsin. And um, the Lord used that to get me to Europe because the summer after I graduated, I went on a mission trip with a team to Poland and spent three months working with a couple that are serving in Poland and their ministry is preschools. They get um, people from the community bringing their children two to five years old, I think, um, into the preschool and then they can minister to those children and to those young families. And one of their main draws is that they have a native English speaker who works alongside the Polish teachers. So that if your kid goes through three years of preschool, they'll know English pretty well by the time they leave. And so they called me up a few months later and asked if I would come over and be one of their English teachers. And that was a paid position, so I didn't need to raise support. And I started seeing the very beginning of God's path of bringing me back to Europe and letting me be used in this, this continent that I had fallen in love with and a culture that I loved. Um, and I was there for a year and loved the group that I worked with, but I didn't get to use music at all. The church that I attended already had established musicians, and um, so, so I started praying. I said, Lord, you've given me all these years and the funds to develop these talents, so show me how I can use them. Um, and around Christmas time, a family friend called me up, and he's been a missionary in Japan for 30-some years, and now he was helping start different Bible schools around the country. And he said, we're starting this school in Romania, and we need someone to come down and do the music for it, so would you consider doing that? And I just laughed at him, because what my, again, I had my plans in a row, and it was a new church was going to start, and I was going to play piano for them. That was, that was my plans so that God had for me, but that's not what he had. I realized later, you know, this is God's answer to my prayer. So I drove down one weekend um, and visited the school and the missionaries there and moved down the following fall to start teaching. So I think that was the fall of um, 2012 or 13. I'm bad at dates. 12 or 13. Um, and I taught there for six and a half years, and I loved it. I'll share a little bit more about how God used that specific ministry to broaden my horizon to be doing what I'm going to do now in France. While I was in Romania, I taught English. That's how I supported myself. Um, I had between 60 and 80 students, and so that was also a really neat ministry opportunity to um, be involved in these families' lives that I wouldn't normally rub shoulders with. Uh, that was really exciting. And um, came back to the state winter Christmas of 2019, so just before COVID hit, um, because the Lord had had directed me into a specific ministry, which the video will explain all about, but um, I wanted to get a further education in the music area, because in church music, piano is very helpful, but you use a lot of vocal and choral skills, and I had not studied those at all. So I got a master's in music from the conservatory in Kansas City, focusing in uh, vocal pedagogy and choral studies and I graduated in May um, so I've been on full-time deputation since May I started last January and I'm gonna let the video go now and then I'll explain to you more what I'm going to do specifically in France Thank you. 
ministry, like working in Sunday school, getting to know my neighbors, meeting people in coffee shops, and doing discipleship groups and uh, one-on-ones with people. And so I'm going to be located in Bordeaux, France. So France is a rectangle, and Bordeaux is on the west coast, really close to the Atlantic Ocean, about two-thirds of the way down. Your map in the back even has it on there, so you can go look at France and find Bordeaux. And it's right there. So I'll be, I'll be working there, and I'll be working under the mentorship of Ed and Sylvia Christie. They have been missionaries in France for over 30 years, so they understand the culture, they understand how to do ministry, and I'm looking forward to learning from them and um, watching how, how the Lord has used them for many years is really encouraging to me. And then the other uh, branch of my ministry is going to be in the area of music. Um, there's a group called Ecle Musica, uh, Church Music, and it is based out of Paris, France, um, Christy Kolos is the one who started that. She's been a missionary in France for, I think, 13, 14 years. And her burden is very similar to mine, to educate the French people themselves on the principles of music, give them tools in uh, actually playing music or singing or choirs so that they can then use that to go and minister and to continue training people uh, in the same way. So Ecclein Musica serves all of French-speaking European churches that includes Luxembourg, Belgium, and Switzerland. They all have French-speaking areas as well. And um, they, they will do anything from offering, we have a, a website database that has a lot of choral songs for unison or two parts or three parts or more advanced, and churches can go there and use that to find resources. Um, France does not have as many resources in music, sacred music, as America does. And so being able to compile that saves a lot of time for these church members. Most French pastors are um, bivocational, and so they anything that can save them time is really helpful. Um, but one of the newest uh, developments that they have is called Piano Duck. And it is an online piano training course that is six weeks for each level, and it's training specifically to play in the church for uh, singing. And so after the first six-week course, you go from knowing nothing, and the first assignment is to play for one of the songs in your church. So our goal is to get them in using what they're learning right away. Um, there's many churches that don't have any musicians at all to help, or maybe um, I did a project for a church up in North France just recently. They have a man who plays guitar and he knows the chords, but he doesn't know how to figure them out. So I went in and wrote in all the chords for a lot of the music that they sing, and that way he can play for them and they can all sing with some sort of music. Um, so that's a little bit of what Ecle Musica does, and I'll be working with them and there is a group of national pastors and lay people around the country that also help with this, um, but because many of them have other ministries, they don't have as much time to dedicate to it, and so there are a lot of projects and a lot of needs that um, I am going to come in and hopefully help to fill that spot because I can dedicate a lot more time to it. Um, our goal in using music is uh, threefold. So there's three things that I've seen throughout the years of doing music, watching other churches, reading the Bible, and a lot of this comes from the verse in Colossians 3.16. Um, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I'm quoting a different verse. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So the first thing that we see is we can use music to worship God. And that's most evident, um, I think, to all of us. That's one of the first things we think of. Um, but repeating the new truths that we learn about God's character, about his promises, and repeating those back to him is a form of worship that we can do through our music. And then we can develop stronger relationships with Christ through music. Chris Anderson is a modern hymn writer. He has very theologically rich hymns. And he has the little phrase, music is theology that sticks. And because these words have that little sticky aspect of the melody, you're going to remember them a lot easier than just spoken prose. Um, so having music that teaches these doctrines, that uh, has the correct theology in them, or helping uh, church leaders realize that, oh, we can pick specific 
music that goes along with what we're teaching and help our, our congregation to understand that, to um, get it more into their souls and to be thinking about it throughout the week is really important. And then the third way is we can evangelize through music. And I hit on this just briefly in the introduction in Sunday school, but people are sometimes more willing to come to a musical event than they might be a regular church service. And so in France, Easter and Christmas are really big times for visitors to want to come. And so you, sometimes two or three churches will get together and compile their resources and put on some sort of concert. And these are great opportunities for new people to come and the members to start building relationships with these people in order to share the gospel with them. Um, France is no longer a Catholic country. I think I mentioned this in the presentation. Um, when I was thinking about France, that's what I had thought. Oh, it's, it's a Catholic country. They're still ruled by the moral principles of Catholicism, but the actual um, teachings in the schools, in society, is very secular. And so um, I was chatting with, with a, a deacon of a church in Bordeaux, and another family and I were talking with him, and the question came up, how long does it take to meet someone and develop a relationship with them and then see them accept Christ, hopefully? And he said, well, um, he was probably around 70 years old. In my experience, it can take 20 to 30 years. Because first you meet a person, and then they are going to watch you for a couple years and see if you are an actual real person or if you're just there to try and proselytize them. So he said, you need to get involved in the community. You need to join some clubs, join a gym, sing in a choir, or something like that. Um, this other family had kids, and he said they're going to be a really great asset being in schools and developing these relationships. So people will watch you for a few years, and then they'll see, oh, they are a nice person. They care about me and then you'll share the gospel with them and they'll push you off and be like nope don't want anything to do with that and then he said they have to do it all over again and be like oh they still they still like me even though I said no and push them off and it's a cycle um, so that is most of the older generation there is a new trend coming in uh, in college age early 20s and most of these young people will claim atheism or agnosticism but they're willing to have a conversation with you about it and so that is really exciting. Um, my first job getting to France is to finish learning the language. And I'm going to be doing that in a university in Bordeaux. And so I'm excited to see what God does. Hopefully meet some of these young people and start developing relationships. Um, and having conversations about, oh, is there a God? How can we know this? And taking them through scripture in that way. So I'm excited to be doing all of these things in France. Um, uh, Lord willing, um, my goal is to go in November. Ecle Musica has a biannual camp then, and so the leaders from all the different areas of France and these other countries are going to come there, and that would just be a really great opportunity for me to go and be able to uh, get to know these people and for them to get to know me all in one setting. So I'm praying, obviously it's going to be the Lord's timing, but that's, that's what I'm praying, that uh, he will raise the funds for me to be able to go in November. So we are going to transition now to music. If you have questions, though, I would love to answer them afterwards. I have a table in the back. Feel free to sign up for my update letters or grab a prayer card and ask me all the questions you might have. So the goal for uh, the next 20 minutes or so, I would really like you to think through the words of the songs. Most of them I'll play, one of them I'll sing. Um, and I want you to think about the truths that they portray, and the words will be up on the screen. Um, many of these songs I'm sure you're very familiar with. So a good challenge is to think about where in scripture are these words coming from? Um, what are the passages that back these up? And so I, I hope that you will have a good time of worshiping the Lord, meditating on who he is. My goal isn't to entertain you, although I hope it sounds pleasant, but uh, my goal is to direct you to the Lord and to his promises and truths through music. Charity, you need to tell them your second churches. Oh, oh, I forgot that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so my sending church is in Kansas City, Missouri, and Pastor Tim Barr is my pastor. Apparently many of you know him. He and Elena. So they sent their greetings. I forgot that. Thank you. <laughs> I am going to say a word or two between. Should I keep my mic on? Okay. 